something that I would need later. Um, and we're bringing it up was convicted of a heinous crime, intentionally starving her helpless stepdaughter and burning the child's body. I want to cry right now. <laughs> it's just a lie. It's just a whole lie. One was outrageously or wantonly vile, horrible, or inhuman in that it involved depravity of mind of the defendant. Parents who brutally tortured child reacts to death row sentence. This woman was responsible for one of the most horrific cases of child harm ever seen, a heart-wrenching and disturbing case that ended in the demise of a little girl. Tiffany Moss is Georgia's only female and Roe inmate, and for good reason. Let's dive into her disgusting crimes. The Little Girl To know this story, one must first give justice to the victim, Imani Gabrielle Moss, who deserves to be remembered much more than her cruel slayer. Imani was born on April 23, 2003. Tragically, shortly after Imani's birth, her mother, addicted to drugs, surrendered her parental rights, and Imani's father, Amon, gained sole custody of her. Imani was one of five children born to her mother, and her mother actually surrendered parental rights to all of her children. But her father was not a far better option. In fact, Iman was charged with and convicted of battery and second-degree child cruelty in 2004, after beating Imani's biological mother in front of her. No self-respecting man would beat a woman to prove his point or show dominance, and consider the fact that witnessing parents fighting, particularly when it escalates to physical violence, can cause significant emotional distress and trauma to children. So he perpetuated emotional violence and trauma on Imani as well. Children are highly sensitive to their parents' emotions and can easily become frightened, anxious, or develop feelings of helplessness in these situations. Parents serve as primary role models for their children. When children witness their parents engaging in violent or regressive behavior, they learn that such behavior is acceptable or even expected in relationships. This will eventually perpetuate a cycle of violence leading to long-term negative consequences for the children as they grow older. Although Imani never even got to reach that point, her life was snuffed out far before her time. Evil Stepmother Iman largely raised Imani and often took her to the Freedom Christian Church. There, he met Tiffany Moss, a preschool teacher. Iman and Tiffany married in July of 2009 and had two children, a son and a daughter. Though there are no records indicating that Tiffany harmed her biological children, she did harm Imani. The harm increased in March 2010 after a beating of Imani caused Moss to lose her job. Imani, then age 6, told a school nurse that she feared going home with a bad report card because she worried her parents would hurt her. She also told the nurse that her stepmother had spanked her with a curtain rod. The nurse then found multiple scabs, bruises, and welts on Imani's arms, back, chest, legs, and shoulders, and Imani was taken to police headquarters. Tiffany was arrested and charged with first-degree child cruelty. Tiffany admitted to hitting Imani three times after she failed to do her homework. She pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years of probation as part of Georgia's first offender program. The Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services GDFCS, signed the plea deal. The GDFCS dismissed the case against Tiffany and Iman after they completed parenting classes. After the March 2010 beating, Imani was taken from her father and stepmother's home and placed with her grandmother, Robin, staying with her for about six months. During this time, Imani's school performance improved. Iman fought for custody of Imani, and in the fall of 2010, the GDFCS returned her to him. Robin fought to retain custody of her granddaughter. Though she suspected Imani was being harmed, she could not persuade authorities to give her custody. That's right, Sharon, and Robin tells me she has not slept well since this trial ended. I want to cry right now. <laughs> um, it's just a lie. It's just a whole lie. It's been a hard time. Very hard time. Because he's seen a lot of stuff that was going on in the house. Prosecutors later argued at trial that the March 2010 harm incident launched an escalating cycle of more harm that ultimately resulted in Imani's demise. Because Moss had pleaded guilty to beating Imani, she was no longer allowed to teach preschool. This made her resent Imani as she blamed her for the job lost. Moss continued to harm Imani for the next several years. In July 2012, Imani twice tried to run away from home. 
In one case, she went to the apartment office and told them she wanted to run away because Moss had tied her up with a belt and placed her in a cold shower. The police responded and were told by Moss that Imani was not telling the truth. Because there was not enough evidence to charge anyone, Imani was returned to Iman and Moss. In another July 2012 incident, Imani ran away and was found sleeping in the bushes of a nearby apartment complex by a police officer. Imani told the officer that she had run away because her stepmother was mean to her. The officer reported the event to the GDFCS and filed runaway and curfew violation charges against Imani to ensure she would see a juvenile court judge. From 2011 to the summer of 2013, the Moss family moved around, sometimes living with family. Iman, who worked long hours, did not see his daughter often. He later reported at trial that she would eat a lot when he saw her on the weekends when he was in charge of the children. When the Mosses lived on their own, Imani rarely saw extended family. In May 2013, the Mosses visited Iman's sister Sharonis's house for Mother's Day. Sharonis and Robin noticed that Imani's hair had been cut. When Robin confronted Moss about it, Moss reportedly said, quote, If you act ugly, you should look ugly. Sharonis also noted that Imani acted more timidly. After the 2012-2013 school year ended, Iman and Moss announced that they would pull Imani from public school and homeschool her. Sharonis objected to the idea and called the GDFCS asking them to intervene. Still, they declined. On August 6, 2013, the GDFCS received an anonymous tip that Imani was being neglected by her father and stepmother and appeared to be thin. According to a lawsuit against the GDFCS filed by Robin, the GDFCS did not visit the home and did not conduct a follow-up due to having no current address and no current maltreatment. It will be something that I would need later, um, and we're bringing that. It's, so, for example, under the Putnam decision and the uh, procedure that they put for request, particularly since it's sight unseen, can you put something in writing? It was outrageously or wantonly vile, horrible, or inhuman in that it involved depravity of mind of the defendant. A heart-wrenching slaughter. Mother's Day, the 12th of May, 2013, was the last time any members of Imani's family, besides her father, stepmother, and siblings, saw her alive. In the late summer of 2013, Iman, Moss, their children, and Imani moved to an apartment in Lawrenceville, Georgia. According to District Attorney Danny Porter, this was when, for all intents and purposes, Imani vanished from the face of the earth. During this time, Iman worked two jobs, making him largely absent from Imani's life. He would leave for his first job in the early morning, briefly return in the late afternoon, and then leave for his second job around 6 p.m. before finally returning at around 10.30 or 11 p.m. While Iman was at work, Moss was left to care for the children. At some point, Moss began to starve Imani. According to prosecutors, the starvation likely lasted several weeks. During this time, Imani was confined to her bedroom. Neighbors only saw Moss's biological children and did not know they had an older sister. Imani eventually became too weak to move and could not leave her bed, urinate, or defecate. Though Moss denied food to Imani, she did take care of and feed her two biological children. On several occasions, she sent Iman pictures of meals she had prepared for her children, and in another instance, she asked her husband to bring home cookie dough so she could bake. At trial, prosecutors pointed out that Imani would have to had smell the baked cookies as she lay in her room starving fatally. According to Dr. Staffenberg, the medical examiner who testified at trial, the process of starving would have been painful. At first, Imani would have experienced hunger pangs, then she would have become fatigued. She would continue losing energy and weight until she ultimately perished. In the early evening of October 24th, Imani suffered what Iman believed was a seizure. Iman testified that when he came home, Moss told him something was wrong with Imani. He then went into the bathroom and found his daughter in the bathtub shaking. Imani was unresponsive and her eyes were rolling back and forth. Iman moved Imani to her bed where she stayed for the next couple of days. Iman visited her during this time and tried to feed her but was unsuccessful. Imani passed away on October 28, 2013. By the time Imani perished, she was severely underweight, with Dr. Staffenberg describing her as, quote, more or less skin and bones. She was 10 years old but weighed only 32 pounds, the weight of the average 3-year-old. Additionally, her organs were found at autopsy to be very small. 
On October 28th, Moss called Iman at work to tell him that Imani was deceased. Iman testified at trial that when he came home from work, the family seemed normal with the children playing and Moss watching TV. He found his daughter lying on a blanket on her bedroom floor. He told his wife they should call the police, though she insisted they couldn't because she would lose her children. Moss told Iman they needed to hide Imani's body and quote-unquote be on her criminal mind. Iman robbed Imani's body with blankets and moved her to the computer room. The couple kept Imani's body in their apartment for several days and their lives largely went back to normal. Iman testified at trial that he would go to work and spend time at home with Imani's body grieving. The Moss couple agreed to cover up Imani's demise. The day after Imani's demise, Moss went to Anna Lennon's and bought new sheets and a new coverall as the ones Imani had used were covered with excrement and urine. Moss suggested burying Imani and reporting her as a runaway. Iman went to Walmart and bought a galvanized trash can, trash bags, charcoal, and lighter fluid. On Halloween, Moss and Iman decided to put Imani's body in the trash can and burn it. When they tried to place her in the trash can, they found that she was stiff with rigor mortis and used duct tape to compress her body. Iman covered her with a comforter. The Mosses then stuffed Imani's body in the trash bag. Then, in the early morning of November 1st, the Moss couple put the trash can containing Imani's body in the back of the car and took their children to find a place to burn it. They found a secluded location to commit the arson and remove the trash can from the vehicle. They added charcoal briquettes to the bottom of the can, doused Imani's body with lighter fluid, and then set it on fire. As the couple watched the body burn, they found out it would not burn to ash, and after about five minutes, they extinguished the fire and took the trash can and Imani's body back to the apartment. I think, I think at this point, it's in... E versus Wiggins, W-I-G-G-I-N-S. That is a U.S. Supreme Court case. Stand up and tell me what it is that you want to address on an ex parte basis. You don't have to give away... ...position to know whether it is proper or not. That's the whole point. ...by the four person. Please give it to counsel for their review as to form, sir. The investigation begins. The day after attempting to burn Imani's body, Iman went to work with Imani's body still in the back of his car. He confessed to a friend about the crime. The friend urged him to call the police. Iman thought about it and after coming home from his second job, he decided to contact the police. At 4 a.m., he made the call saying he was going to take his own life. Iman informed Moss about his call to the police. Upon learning that the police had been called, Moss placed the trash can with Imani's remains in a grassy area at the apartment and fled in the family vehicle with her children. Upon arrival at the apartment, the police were told by Iman that Imani had drunk some chemicals and perished. He claimed that he had panicked and put her body in a trash can outside the apartment and tried to cremate it. Police found the body and did not believe Iman's story, quickly identifying him and his wife as suspects. Iman was arrested almost immediately. Moss dropped her children off at her mother's house and ultimately turned herself in. Iman ultimately confessed to covering up Imani's slang by reporting her as a runaway and trying to burn her body. In 2015, he pled guilty to felony slaying and concealing a demise. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In exchange, he agreed to testify against Moss, who rejected a plea deal that would have allowed her to be sentenced to life in prison. Iman is currently incarcerated at the Smith State Prison in Glenville, Georgia. The case against Moss instead went to trial. Trial and Sentence Moss's trial began on April 15, 2019, and the jury consisted of six men and six women. Moss, who was appointed lawyers through the state office of the Capitol Defender, decided to represent herself despite Judge Hitchinson's efforts to persuade her otherwise. Instead of representing her, her defense attorneys served as standby attorneys to answer any legal questions. During pre-trial hearings and jury selection, Judge Hutchinson urged Moss to rely upon the standby counsel, but she refused. Moss did not give an opening statement, nor did she cross-examine any witnesses or give a closing argument. The 84 case um, was, I believe, presented to me. Some certain situations, I guess, as far as... Uh... 
outrageously or wantonly vile, horrible, or inhuman in that it involved torture of the victim, correct? Correct. Right. Is it unanimous? Yes, it is, Your Honor. Has it been signed by your foreperson? District Attorney Danny Porter and Assistant District Attorney Lisa Jones called 18 witnesses, including Imani's aunt, grandmother, and a teacher. The attorneys also called Iman and Dr. Staffenberg, the medical examiner who performed an autopsy on Imani's body. Before her demise, Imani went to school and there she tried telling teachers but was too afraid and hearing her teachers and grandmother speak of her, it always seemed Imani wanted to make people happy. Imani's teachers, family, friends, and anyone who came to know her described her as just precious. Lisa Neal, Imani's fourth grade teacher at Bethesda Elementary School, testified at Tiffany's trial that, quote, Imani was precious and it was a blessing to have her in my classroom. She was a wonderful friend to every student, even a student that bullied her she tried so hard to be friends with on a daily basis. On April 29th, Moss was convicted on all six counts, including one count of malice slaying, two counts of felony slaying, two counts of cruelty to children, and one count of concealing a demise. The jury deliberated for less than three hours. During the sentencing phase, Moss declined to address the jury, present mitigating evidence, or have her relatives who had attended the trial testify on her behalf. She also refused to make a closing statement. In the state's closing argument, Porter argued that Moss did not deserve a life sentence, whether it be a life sentence with parole or a life sentence without parole. She should not be given the opportunity to be released, he argued, because she would never change. Quote, She's shown you too much of her capacity for cruelty. There will always be that dark side waiting to come out. Unquote. He also argued that for Moss, life without parole would not be a worse sentence than perishing because she did not regret her crimes and would never be bothered by them. After closing arguments, the jury began deliberating. After the first day, they appeared conflicted and were told by Judge Hutchinson to go home and quote-unquote sleep on it. They continued deliberations the next day and ultimately agreed on the capital penalty as a punishment for Moss. Judge Hutchinson agreed with the jury's recommendation and sentenced Moss, then aged 36, to perish by lethal injection. Moss was the first person to be sentenced to the capital punishment in Georgia in over five years. Judge Hutchinson scheduled her punishment for between June 7th and 14th, 2019. The punishment did not occur during the June 7-14 to timeframe due to the appeals process, which resulted in an automatic stay being applied to the initial scheduled date. She is currently incarcerated at Arendale State Prison and is Georgia's only female and row inmate. If Moss is eventually put down, she will be the third woman in Georgia to be put down since 1945. The first was Lena Baker, an African-American maid who, in 1944, was sentenced to the capital punishment by an all-white, all-male jury for the demise of a man she said held her against her will, threatened her life, and appeared poised to hit her with a metal bar. Georgia's parole board posthumously pardoned Baker 60 years after her punishment, finding that it, quote, was a grievous error to deny her clemency, unquote. The second was Kelly Gessendaner, who was put down in 2015 for conspiring with her boyfriend to have her husband slain in 1997. Despite representing herself at trial, Moss accepted legal representation in her appeal. Soon after she was sentenced to her demise, the Georgia Capital Defender Group filed a motion asking for a new trial, arguing, among other things, that Moss was not competent to act as her own attorney. According to her attorneys, Moss was neuropsychological testing data that showed the defendant to have damage to the premotor and prefrontal regions of the brain. A status hearing regarding the motion was held on August 23, 2019, but it could not save her from paying for her sins. The Aftermath Iman and Moss, who remained married, lost custody of their two children after Imani's slaying. The children were sent to live with foster parents. The Moss couple, along with both Moss and Iman's mothers, tried to gain custody. In 2019, Porter told local news that the children were adopted by their foster parents. The couple's son, who was three years old when Imani was slain, reportedly did have some memories of the crime. However, according to Porter, at the time of the interview in April 2019, the children were doing great and may never know what have happened. Imani slaying led to criticisms of and systematic changes in Georgia's child welfare system. After the slaying, an intake case manager, a social services administrator, and a program assistant at the GDFCS were all terminated. Others were reportedly disciplined. 
The slaying led to the department to enact reforms, including deeper investigations into allegations of harm and changing how it assembles maltreatment reports. New case managers and supervisors were hired, reducing caseloads. Agency workers no longer decide whether reports warrant investigations based entirely on information gathered over the telephone. Additionally, no case is assigned a less serious, lower priority status until a caseworker meets a child who allegedly has been harmed and neglected. After Imani's demise, along with several others, the Child Welfare Reform Council was commissioned by Governor Nathan Deal. In January 2015, the council released a report with recommendations on ways to improve Georgia's child welfare system. In 2018, Imani's grandmother Robin filed a lawsuit in the Gwinnett County State Court against the GDFCS, arguing that caseworkers were aware of deteriorating conditions and harm in the Moss family and could have acted earlier. Robin is also suing the Department of Human Services. She's seeking a jury trial and reasonable compensatory damages. According to the lawsuit, there were multiple occasions where the department could have investigated the Moss household and intervened on behalf of Imani. As a result of the negligence of DFCS and its agents, Imani suffered constant harm and deprivation from 2008 until her untimely demise. The lawsuit also states, as a direct and proximate result of defendant's wrongful conduct, plaintiff is entitled to recover for the wrongful demise of Imani, including the full value of the economic and non-economic value of her life had she lived. Was convicted of a heinous crime, intentionally starving her helpless stepdaughter and burning the child's body. Georgia versus Tiffany Nicole Moss. Count one, findings of jury as to alleged statutory aggravating circumstances. When the incident happened, I called 911. And when I didn't, it was, I put myself in bed by. The case that was cited by standby counsel, which is McCaskill, M C K A S K L. What went wrong? Cases of child neglect leading to a demise are undeniably one of the most horrific and tragic occurrences that can happen in our society. These heart-wrenching incidents highlight the profound failure of our collective responsibility to protect and care for the most vulnerable members of our communities. They reveal a disturbing truth about the callousness that can exist within our society, reflecting a deep-seated disregard for the well-being and lives of innocent children. When a child falls to victim to neglect, it is a grave indication of systemic and individual failures. Neglect, in its essence, is a form of abandonment where basic needs such as nourishment, shelter, health care, and emotional support are denied. Children who rely entirely on the care and provision of adults are left defenseless and exposed to unimaginable harm. Their well-being and survival depend on the adults in their lives, making it our collective duty to ensure their safety. The tragic demise resulting from child neglect like Imani serves as a stark reminder of the many ways in which our society has become callous. It reveals the erosion of empathy and compassion, as well as the breakdown of community and familial bonds. It forces us to confront uncomfortable truths about our priorities, values, and the alarming indifference that can pervade our lives. Such cases lay bare the profound neglect not only by immediate caregivers, but also by those who may have had an opportunity to intervene. Family, neighbors, teachers, and community members all play a vital role in safeguarding our children, and their failure to recognize the signs of neglect or to report concerns contributes to the dire outcomes. This collective failure amplifies the tragedy, emphasizing the need for greater awareness, education, and proactive intervention. The repercussions of such intense child neglect and harm are far-reaching and devastating. The loss of a child's life leaves an indelible void impacting not only their immediate family but also the wider community. The ripple effects of such a profound tragedy are immeasurable and may be felt for generations to come. The pain, grief, and trauma experienced by those affected are profound and long-lasting, forever altering the course of their lives. Moreover, these cases expose the flaws in our child protection systems and highlight the urgent need for reform. They reveal the inadequacy of existing policies, procedures, and resources meant to ensure the safety and well-being of children. It is a wake-up call for society to reevaluate its commitment to safeguarding children, demanding an overhaul of child protection services, enhance training for professionals, and increase support for families in crisis. Ultimately, cases like Imani serve as a grim reminder of our collective responsibility as a society. 
They force us to confront uncomfortable truths about our capacity for indifference and the dire consequences of failing to prioritize the safety and well-being of our children. It is a call to action, a plea for change, and a reminder that the most vulnerable members of our society deserve our utmost care, protection, and love. That's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time at the next one.